Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to this lecture on Bonn. I will show you now in, in two parts, in the two-part lecture, uh, a lot of information, I give you a lot of information about cortical bone and about the bone in general. And uh, later on, after this, we will have the chance to attract a few questions. So the following lecture is about bone, and the lecture is intended to be uh, seen by dental implantologists because I feel that implantologists do not know the basics of bone. We all have learned about bone, of course, in our university times, but we have learned it from the point of view of an anatomist or of a physiologist, but we have not heard information about bone um, from implantologists. So this lecture gives you a lot of information and I hope that you will learn from it a lot because as soon as you know about bone, as soon as you know what bone is doing at the very moment when uh, the implant is inserted or at the very moment when the implant is in function, then you will have no problem to understand what the bone is doing at the moment. So implantologists must know everything about bone just as carpenters know everything about wood. Now, we have all learned that osteoclasts, osteoblasts and osteocytes are part of the bone. They are embedded in bone, they are creating bone and they are resorbing bone. Uh, this is knowledge which we have received uh, in our student times and now I will show you how you will apply this knowledge for dental implantology. Now, osteoclasts are very important cells because they are resorbing bone. The resorption of the bone comes before the formation of the bone in the normal case. So we need osteoclasts to get enough resorption. We need osteoclasts in order to renew the bone and to uh, allow a good perfusion through the bone. So the purpose of osteoclasts is resorbing bone. Osteoclasts, however, do not uh, work on their own. They work in little uh, work units together with osteoblasts and osteocytes those cells which are forming the bone and regulating the bone. Now osteoblasts stem from the bloodstream, so they don't come directly out of the bone, they come from the bloodstream. The purpose of the osteoblasts is to build up bone matrix and they then develop further to osteocytes. Now it's important to understand that osteoblasts always stem from the bloodstream, while osteoclasts, the bone resorbing cell, cells are stemming uh, from the bone itself. It is important to understand this because we are doing bone augmentations, we are transplanting bone and we are assuming while we are doing this that we are transplanting live osteoblasts and that those osteoblasts which we are transplanting are going to produce new bone or they are going to stay at least. This is not true. Osteoblasts which have been transplanted with the bone do usually not survive this procedure. So new osteoblasts have to come into the scene. They have to be uh, brought by the blood vessels and they have to develop them inside the bone. And only those new osteoblasts will uh, create new bone. Osteocytes are aged version of osteoblasts, so while uh, bone is developing and while bone is aging, uh, osteoblasts get buried in the matrix and these osteocytes um, have almost no uh, metabolic activity um, because they are buried, they have no contact to the bone, but they have a lot of uh, other purposes. They are in contact through dendrites with other osteocytes, osteoblasts and even cells of other osteons. When we talk about bone, we have to understand that there are different types of bone. Uh, as implantologists, we usually know the D1, D2, D3, D4 bone, but in fact this classification is not very helpful. It's not helpful because it doesn't describe the types of bone we are working with, it only describes the mineralization, the degree of the mineralization of the bone, and this in fact is not a very valuable information. So the first bone I want to mention here is the woven bone. Woven bone develops usually in fracture sites. Woven bone also develops in extraction sites. But woven bone is not a stable version of the bone. Woven bone develops, it matures and it's resorbed. It is resorbed by osteonal bone. So all of our bones 
all of our bones in the adult um, person uh, consists out of osteonal bone. It's a highly organized bone and it consists out of many osteons. This graph shows you an osteon. You see on the right side uh, the resorption area. These are the osteoclasts and on the left side of the osteon you will see the osteoblasts in action. The osteoblasts are forming the matrix, so osteoblasts are not forming bone, only a non-mineralized matrix. And this matrix is then later on mineralized. In the zone called reversal zone, you, as you can see here, this reversal zone, you will not see any bone at all. It simply takes some time between the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts. It takes some time until the newborn formation starts. So all the bone which is resorbed by the osteoblasts is then transported into the bloodstream and out of the bloodstream uh, all the parts which are needed, especially calcium and phosphate, are taken out of the bloodstream again. So it is not possible to take parts of the old bone and directly to put it into the new bone. This all goes through the bloodstream. The little black cells, which you can see here, are the osteocytes. They are buried because the diameter of these osteons is getting smaller and smaller while the matrix is formed. So the osteons are aged version, or you can say versions which are not in contact with, uh, not in direct contact with the bloodstream, and therefore they become pyknotic. However, the osteoclasts transform a lot of information. Uh, from osteoblasts to other osteoblasts or from one osteon to another osteon. Now the purpose of osteons is to resorb and replace small units or packets of bone. Osteons are regulating the bone mass but however this has no influence on the serum calcium level. I'm mentioning this because we have all learned uh, that the serum calcium level is influenced by the activity of the bone. But in fact, the serum calcium level in adults is very constant. And uh, even in patients, for example, in polytraumatic patients, they have a very constant, constant serum calcium level. This picture shows a cross-section through bovine bone with a primary osteon. The primary osteon is in the center and a secondary osteon on the left side. Showing you this here, this is the primary osteon and here's the secondary osteon. Now the secondary osteons are resorbing osteons while primary osteons are resorbing primary bone or woven bone. In this graph the same story is shown again. So osteoclasts are moving this osteon into the, into the, into the right or to the upper and the lower area. This is bone, it's native bone, old bone, so probably it is uh, osteonal bone, it can be also woven bone. And as you can see, blood vessels are formed inside the osteons and these blood vessels are transporting away whatever the, osteons, the osteoclasts are resorbing. And on this picture you see a histology of the same situation. This osteon is moving to the right side, this osteon is moving to the left side. And this is the resorption front of this osteon, this is the resorption front of this uh, osteon. And uh, these osteons are moving through bone. Keep in mind that osteons always move through bone, so there is no possibility that osteons are moving through soft tissue. So uh, the old idea that, that the fractured bone shows a primary healing, the primary healing this means that the, the fractures are reduced, and then directly the osteons are, are um, traveling from one side of the fracture to the other fracture. This idea uh, is uh, not valid anymore. Today we, we are assuming that there are always, um, there's always a woven bone formation between the two parts of the fractures and the osteons are then walking or wandering, um, promoting themselves through these uh, woven bone areas. On this slide you see a crosscut through osteonal bone. So this is a very mature osteonal bone. Um, as you can see from the mineralization, some of the osteons are highly mineralized, other osteons are not so much mineralized, and uh, newer osteons are traveling through older osteons and thereby they are cutting off the bloodstream of the older osteons. 
The Austrians travel more or less in the same direction, but as a matter of fact, Austrians can cross through a number of other Austrians, thereby cutting them all off, and this reduces the blood supply in aged Austrian bone. And that's why if we have uh, parts of the, especially the mandible, which have been edentulous for many years, if we operate on this area, we don't see any blood because the bloodstream, the, the little vessels in the haversion canals, they have been cut off by Austrians. So in the worst case, one Austrian per jaw is left over and all the others are cut off. If you look at the Austrians, you will see that there's around each Austrian a black rim. And this black rim is a non-mineralized tissue. So the outer part of the Austrian is uh, non-mineralized. This means that if an implant is integrated into osteonal bone, the last layer of bone, uh, the layer which is directly in contact with the implant, uh, is non-mineralized. It's a, it's a fibrous tissue. And uh, many years ago, in the 90s, we had a lot of discussion about the question whether there is a fibrous integration or an osteous integration. And uh, this discussion was, uh, was worldwide. But in fact, what was discussed is do we have an integration into osteonal bone or do we have an integration into woven bone? Because in woven bone, we do not necessarily see this last layer of fibrous tissue. So it doesn't matter in which way the implant is integrated. So if we have a secondary integration by osteonal bone, we will see this last layer, this, this, this black layer, uh, soft tissue layer in the vicinity of the implant. And we see uh, the bone, uh, the mineralized matrix uh, next to it. If we have integration into woven bone, of course, this last layer is missing. What you don't see on this picture at all are resorption cavities. So this bone, this bone is very stable. There is no osteonal remodeling going on. Um, and of course, most of our bone looks like this. A completely different picture is visible now. You see a lot of black holes here on this picture. So these black holes are resorption cavities. The bone has been resorbed already by the osteoclasts. There is not yet uh, a real refilling. You see a little bit matrix down here. You see more matrix in this area. You see almost no matrix here. So in most of these osteons, the refilling only begins. This osteon shows no refilling. So it's a little bit later. And you also see well refilled, but non, not uh, remineralized osteons in the lower part of the picture. The outer layer of bone uh, it consists out of circumferential lamellae. So these lamellae uh, are, are kind of holding the bone together and these lamellae are produced by the periosteum. This graph shows that osteo osteons can divide up. So out of one osteon, a number of osteon branches can develop and these branches are traveling through the bone. The direction of the osteon is only given by function, so there's no chemotaxis. And the endpoint of osteons are either the periosteum or the endosteum. So at some stage, of course, every osteon must end up and it's ending up at either surface, at the inner surface of the bone or the outer surface of the bone. Since there is no chemotaxis, all these ideas of <laughs> implant manufacturing companies that they will create um, a very intricate surface and this makes the bone grow towards the surface, this is of course not true. Uh, the osteon has no possibility to recognize an um, implant surface. It uh, only follows functional demands and uh, therefore whatever surface an implant has, uh, this has no influence on the osteons. Um, as long, of course, as long, of course, the, as the surface is not toxic. Now let's look at the timeline. As you see on this uh, on this graph, uh, the different the different stages of the formation of the osteon and the lifetime of the osteons take different time. So the activation takes approximately three days. This means that after a fracture, after an injury, or after an implant placement. For three days, nothing will happen, and then the osteon will start to develop. 
the resorption or the, the traveling speed of the ostium is 40 micrometers per day. So that's not very fast, but it's very steady. And keep in mind that the ostium can travel throughout the whole bone. So it's this, this repair, this osteonal repair is not a localized process, but it always affects the whole bone. To give you an example, if you, if you injure your skin, in this area, you will get you will get the repair, you will get a scar, and the, the skin will be repaired here. So this is a very localized action. If you would injure the bone, for example, here, all of the hollow bone will be remodeled. You will not see a localized activity, but this osteonal repair goes throughout all of the bone, and it goes through non-affected bone areas. The lag time, this is the time between the, uh, the osteoclast resorption and the new formation of the matrix is 30 days, so for 30 days nothing happens. During those 30 days, of course, the osteoclast front is moving on. Then the refilling starts. The refilling, this is the, the production of the matrix. Then we see a primary mineralization, which takes 10 days. The primary mineralization starts around half a year after this uh, activation of the osteons and we can see a secondary mineralization another 180 days later. So after this primary mineralization has taken place then we see more mineralization approximately for another half a year or even longer. This can even take up to two years. So basically the whole process almost takes a year and we have very, let's say, bad bone, very porous bone, affected bone for a long time and we have normalization in these osteons for approximately half a year. And this half a year period is the same period which was recommended by Mr. Brandon Mark when he was talking about integration of implants. So he found out by empirical uh, experiments that uh, it will take half a year until the bone mineralizes. Uh, so the implants are then stable. And keep in mind, however, that Mr. Mr. Brandemark worked only in spongious bone, so he didn't anchor his implants in cortical bone. In cortical bone, we have a different situation because this process of remodeling is not so strong in real cortical bone, in highly mineralized cortical bone. From this uh, textbook, I took this graph. This is an osteon, a secondary osteon traveling through the bone. Here's another osteon. As you can see, blood vessels are coming from outside, from the periosteum, and they are feeding these haversian canals. Now, in the textbooks, of course, there's always a haversian canal inside every osteon, and in this, inside every haversian canal there's a blood vessel. I mentioned before that this is, this is only true for the very early stages of bone formation, of osteonal bone formation, because the uh, osteons are, are crossing each other and then, of course, the blood vessels are stopped. Around the bone you see the circumferential lamellae, and these lamellae are formed by the periosteum. There's a term in our profession, it's called lamella bone. So lamella bone is not a very precise term, so if you're speaking ab about lamella bone, so either use the term circumferential lamellae, it means those lamellae, or the osteonal lamellae, then you are talking about these lamellae, so please keep these things apart. I will keep it apart in my lectures to make, to make clear what we are talking about. On the inside of the bone, towards the spongious bone, we see the endosteum. This endosteum, as mentioned, can be the end point of a secondary osteon. Now, of course, the older the bone gets, the less osteonal remodeling takes place. I will come to this at the end of the lecture. However, if we operate on bone, if we place implants, we will see a local increase of osteonal remodeling and we will see even a regional increase of osteonal uh, remodeling. Uh, this graph uh, was taken from a paper by Atkinson, 1977. It's a very interesting paper. So what he did, he worked uh, with pigs and he created a cartography of mineralization of the cortical bone of the pig. So you see the, the left outside of the mandible, the left inside of the mandible, the right outside of the mandible, the right inside of the mandible. And this is the start point of the experiment. 
you see that we, uh, there's a quite a high mineralization in this area, a little bit lower mineralization in this area, and this is the start point. After three months, after, three months after placing an implant, actually in this area, you see a completely different map of mineralization. So the density in general has gone down, as you can see here, for example, but it also has gone down in parts of the mandibles which are not affected. And after 12 months, you see that the mineralization has not yet gone up completely. Now, the same takes place for, for every change which we perform in the mandible or also the maxilla. So, always we see a lot of remodeling. This remodeling brings down uh, the mineralization, not only locally in the area where the tooth was extracted or where the, the implant has been placed, but the whole mandible will remodel. Now, this information should, should warn us not to perform too many operations on a mandible when we are planning to place implants. So there are some dentists, they, they extract today three teeth and they extract after six weeks another three teeth. Then they do another operation or they take out a cyst and then at the end of the process they start placing the implant. Now, if you remember this curve, it's of course exactly the wrong thing to do because after every injury of the bone you will create a lot of osteonal remodeling so the bone turns into Swiss cheese and again and again this remodeling process starts and uh, of course you will have a very very unstable bone and you will have a lot of woven bone uh, in these areas and this is of course what you don't want especially you don't want this when you plan to place implants in an immediate loading process. To come back to, to the experiment of, of Atkinson, which, uh, which every, every implantologist definitely must know, so keep this picture in, in your brain, you have to kind of embrand it into your brain, because this picture shows that the less operations you will do on a person, the more stable the bone will be. And it also shows that it takes a long time, you see, we, are, we, are, we can watch here 12 months, it takes a long time until the mineralization is back. Therefore, I recommend that you always will extract teeth, you will take out cysts, you will clean the periodontal tissues and so on, and then immediately you will place the implants because at this stage you will have the most stable bone. It, it can take a year or longer until the bone will be as stable again, therefore you should use this situation and you should not uh, wait uh, wait for the healing of the bone or wait for anything. Anyway, the pa patient doesn't want to wait for anything. The patient immediately wants the teeth and the immediate loading and the immediate uh, placement of implants after extraction is uh, justified by, this, uh, by the bone. So this is actually the best treatment of the bone or from the bone point of view. I mentioned that, that bone in adults is very stable. Of course, there is a baseline remodeling. We have approximately 5% of the bone remodeled every year, which means that every 20 years, our entire skeleton is completely remodeled. And this is, of course, not exactly true, because it can happen, and it will happen, that some of the bone will be remodeled again and again, and other parts of uh, the bone will not be remodeled at all, even in 20 years. So part of our bone is, is simply very, very old, and other parts of the bone are two, three, four times remodeled in 20 years. But on the average, you can say that 5% of our bone is remodeled every year. Now, uh, having said all this about osteonal bone, I want to come to an extreme example of osteonal remodeling, and this is the osteoporosis. In osteoporotic bone, uh, the resorption is stronger than the new build up of the bone. As you can see on this picture on the left side, um, the bone is, uh, there's almost no osteoporosis visible. On the right side, there's a lot of osteoporosis visible. Keep in mind that usually the patient, the osteoporotic patient, uh, is performing the same activity every day. So the function of the bone, I mean, this. The, the, providing the stability for, for the body, providing a, a base and a counterpart for the muscles uh, is uh, of course given. So the osteoporotic patient has a lack of bone mass, but typically the osteoporotic patient has a very, very high quality bone. 
of course, this high quality of bone is paid for by elasticity, so the mineralization goes up and the elasticity goes down. So that's why uh, osteoporotic patients can suffer from uh, fractures, and if they suffer from fractures, of course, the treatment of the fractures is difficult. Not because it's so difficult to reduce the bone, but it's difficult uh, the, to uh, screw it together or to fixate anything uh, into this bone. In this picture you see another ca uh, case of severe uh, osteoporosis. Uh, so the top um, picture is taken, for example, from a 35-year-old patient. You see everything is okay. There's a big bone mass. Um, typical remodeling, small remodeling areas are visible. In the middle you see a lot of remodeling and the bone mass has been reduced strongly. And the lower picture shows a severe case of osteoporosis. There's almost no bone left, but keep in mind that this bone is of a very high quality. So basically the osteoporotic patient doesn't have a D1 bone, it has a D0 triple A+. So two things have to be taken separately, so one is the remodeling and one is the modeling. I was talking about remodeling a lot already in this lecture. So remodeling means the restructuring of the existing bone due to BMU activity, due to osteonal remodeling. So remodeling is necessary to renew our bone from inside out while we are walking on these bones. We cannot simply take cut out pieces of the bone and make them new, but we are, of course, walking throughout all of our life on the bones and uh, nevertheless the bone needs to be renewed. And this is done by the process of remodeling, by osteonal remodeling. Now modeling, on the other hand, is also taking place. The modeling is changing the shape of our bone. Modeling can mean adding of bone or reduction of bone. I will show you histology. You see on this picture a BOI implant has been placed into the mandible of a dog and this picture has been taken uh, three and a half months after this operation. So the specimen was taken three and a half months later. You can see here the old cortical and outside of the old cortical you see newly modeled bone and this bone was modeled because there was a lot of uh, activity, a lot of stress on the bone and the only way to, to cope with these stresses for the bone is to increase the quantity of the bone through the post process of modeling. So modeling is the production or the generation of bone where there was no bone previously. It requires an initial functional stimulus. It requires also a sterility so the modeling will not take place on those sides of the bone which have been opened, where, where a flap has been made. Uh, there are some examples which you all know of modeled bone which has remained over time, especially the tori mandiboli, you know all those. And a special kind of modeling, uh, the augmentation could be called a special kind of modeling also, however of course the augmentation doesn't require any functional stimulus, the augmentation requires only blood and it requires some stability. In the case of the augmentation, the augmentation with non-resolvable augmentation material, um, we uh, create a situation where every little part of augmentation material becomes an implant and gets integrated like an implant. As you can see on this picture, the newly modeled bone here up on the upper right side of the mandible uh, shows low mineralization. Now either this mineralization will go slowly, slowly up or it will be resorbed. As you can see on this picture, there are some resorption cavities. That these are the black holes here. So it looks like this newly modeled bone is going to be changed into osteonal bone and then of course it's going to be mineralized. Keep in mind also that the old cortical has to be resorbed. As you can see up here on this picture, the old cortical line is gone. So a lot of resorption takes place here. There is no cortical here. There is also no new cortical out here yet. So there is a, there is a situation when the old cortical is already resorbed and the new cortical has not yet been formed or at least has not uh, received a lot of mineralization. 
if you work with cortical bone, of course, you, this, will, this will concern you a lot because we don't want <laughs> that the cortical gets resorbed, so we should be very careful when performing our, our operation not to create a situation where the cortical is fading without or is resorbing without that the new cortical is there. And this is one of the reasons why I don't recommend to work in immediate load implantology in cortical or cortical basal implantology with augmentations because if we create an augmentation with whatever material we do it, we are creating exactly this situation where the old cortical must be resorbed because the cortical has, has to be on the outside of the bone. It can't remain somewhere on, 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 on the inside like, like the beam inside the building. The cortical is always on the outside and if we create an augmentation, of course this, uh, this inner cortical is going to be resorbed and we don't know when or if there's going to be an outside cortical. Now those two pictures um, show an endoprosthesis. This patient has been wearing this endoprosthesis for 16 years and there was one side, the left side was operated and the right side was not operated. I'm showing you this picture in order to give you an example of changes which take place inside the bone when uh, implants are being placed. So the endoprosthesis itself is missing here on this picture, so it, it has fallen out. What you see around here, this is the cement, so at that time these prostheses were cemented. And of course this is the non-operated side. Now, let's, let's take a look together at what has happened. Now first of all we see a reduction of bone mass. So the operated side shows a lot less bone than the non-operated side. The reason is that part of the function of the bone has been taken over by the implant. So this low transmitting function has been taken over by the implant and uh, therefore the cortical bone has become much less. You may know that, that in, in fracture treatment when, when bones are, are plated with, the, with bone plates, these uh, plates are being taken out after some time because exactly the same thing would happen if you would leave the implants in. So the implants will uh, create a stress shielding effect and the stress shielding effect is visible on this picture here on the left side and the stress shielding effect unfortunately has to be expected also around dental implants. So at the, way back at the time when I was working in, uh, in Germany, we were, we were selling the implants to the health insurances, telling the health insurance that, uh, that placing the implants would prevent bone loss. Uh, of course, the, the opposite is true. It doesn't, doesn't prevent bone loss, as you can see here on this example, because there's a stress shielding effect. And uh, in, I mean, in the best case, we are restoring function. I mean, this is the, the unique selling proposition. But uh, but uh, to to prevent bone loss with the help of an implant, this of course is uh, rubbish. It's not true. Second thing you see here on the picture on the left side is that a cortical is developing around uh, around the implant and around the cement. The reason for this change. Uh, in, in structure is that the loads are now coming from the inside of the bone. Typically in a, in a hollow bone, of course, when, when it bends, the maximum loads are on the outside of the bone. But as soon as this endoprosthesis is uh, installed, lots of loads come from the inside and of course these, these loads have to, be, has to be caught up and this work will be done only by the cortical. Now this inner cortical is in connection with the outer cortical by sponges bone. As you can see here, these are those trabecular, and so part of the part of the load is then transmitted to the outer cortical. As you can see here, more is transmitted there, and less is transmitted there. So we learn from these pictures that the bone mass around implants is reduced. We learn from these pictures that around the implant the cortical will uh, develop if the implant is loaded and if uh, loads are transmitted from the implants into the bone and the same situation is found of course in uh, dental implantology. We are using actually in dental implantology the word uh, osseointegration. Osseointegration means uh, in that there is a direct contact between the implant and the bone. 
So also Austrian integration is the big aim. Um, I want to remind you that uh, at the same time when Mr. Mr. Brandenburg was creating the word Austrian integration, there was another uh, scientist working in uh, Germany, Mr. Donut, Professor Donut from Hamburg University, and he was creating the word extraterritorialization. So what Brandenburg was, was calling Austrian integration, Mr. Donut called it extraterritorialization. And this word extraterritorialization was aiming at exactly this cortical. Because he found that, for example, around cysts or around integrated implants, we find this cortical. And he concluded that this cortical is created by the body for the same reason in the case of the cysts and in the case of the implant. So when thinking about osseointegration, always think also a little bit about the word extraterritorialization because this word gives a more clear description of what actually is happening. The body is trying to form some borderline around the implant and uh, it is doing this with the help of a cortical. And keep in mind that the, this inside cortical which you see here, or the, in, the inside uh, cortical around our, our dental implants, is a very simple way of demarcation for uh, the body. And it's the same kind of demarcation which is needed towards the outside of the bone and towards the inside of the implant. Basically, this, this cortical line and the, and the periosteum especially, which is, uh, which is formed around the bone on the outside, is creating the border between, um, between an area of high mineralization and low metabolic activity. Because this is, this is the, the, the principal situation of bone, low metabolic activity, high mineralization, and uh, on the other side of the border we have soft tissues, we have muscles, we, we maybe have other organs, and uh, these parts of the body um, provide a very, uh, when there's no mineralization and there's a very, very high blood supply, a, a very high um, oxygen saturation, and a lot of blood supply and high oxygen saturation is not compatible to the survival of bone, so that's why that's why this area between the soft tissue and the, and the hard tissue has to have a very, very strict border. And if you should uh, take away this border, you will always create a granulation. Granulation means nothing else than that the, the soft tissue is invading into, into the sphere, into the territory of the bone. Now I've told you a lot about osteons, about osteonal remodeling, about load transmission. And you saw um, in the example here, down here, um, the picture is again in small, you saw that from the implant to the cortical to the outer cortical the uh, load transmission takes place. And if you look at uh, on the picture up here, you can see that those three implants are integrated directly into the cortical. So there's a high mineralization between the implants and the cortical. And you see no mineralization between those three implants and before and after these, uh, these three implants. These implants are in the bone 10 years. They are very well osseointegration. There's no problem with the osseointegration. And it shows you that, that in the reality, all osseointegration in dental implantology works into the direction of the cortical. So this is, this is the truth, the sad truth maybe, that, that, uh, that all, the, all the load transmission goes only into the direction of the cortical. This of course makes, makes sense from the mechanic point of view. And uh, it's of course a little bit sad <laughs> for all those uh, implant manufacturing companies to realize that, that the, the surface of the implant is of course of no importance. You see this implant, those three implants and the implants on the other side, they have of course the same type of surface all around the implant. It's, it's not that, that into the direction we have the beautiful SL active surface or tyunite or whatever and, and in the, inside the mandible the, the, they have forgotten to put the surface on. It's not true. I mean the surface is all the same. But as you can see the surface doesn't create a bone formation, it doesn't um, guarantee the, the integration. The only integration of guarantee is given by function and we will see a very good integration and integration at a very high degree of mineralization only into the direction of the cortical. Another, another lesson which we can learn from this picture is that we don't need so much surface. 
as you can see, maybe half of this implant or more than half of the implant is not integrated and it's still in function. So why are we putting so big implants into our patients if we don't need all this lot of surface? You see, the, the marketing, the marketing of, of implant manufacturing companies, they tell us you need a big surface and you even, you have to sandblast it and you have to acid edges and you have to increase the surface like mad. But if you look at the picture of these well-integrated implants, you can see you don't even need half of the surface. You don't uh, need uh, sandblasting. You don't need acid etching because simply the, these implants are too big. These bullets are by far too big and there is not enough function to integrate these implants completely. Only parts of the implants are integrated. This is a cross cut through the same situation. So it's not a fake. This is the real situation. You see there is no mineralization around the implants in the center of the bone. And of course the implants are well integrated into the cortical. So this takes place every day. This is the real life situation. You see another case where three implants are placed uh, in the left mandible and again you see that there is no load transmission taking place between the implants and therefore there is no uh, mineralization and of course again all these implants show the same surface all around and on this picture you can see down here uh, a cross cut, a CT cross cut and you see that there is really no mineralization between the implants and there doesn't have to be any mineralization for good function of the implants. The same is true, of course, also in the maxilla. As you can see, this implant is uh, in the premolar position in the upper jaw. It is well integrated into the cortical, so the cortical seems to even have been shrinking towards the implant a little bit. And in the vicinity of the, implants, of the implant, you don't see any mineralization in the center of the bone. So to conclude this, we see typically very good integration of the implant in the cortical bone because the load transmission takes place only into the cortical bone. We don't see uh, load transmission between the implants and we don't have any load transmission of the implant into the spongious bone because the spongious bone is not well able to carry those loads. So in the case of, of two-stage implants which heal in, of course we have to wait until the cortical around the implants form and until this cortical then is connected to the outer cortical. Uh, so this type of integration is possible. But whenever the implant is in contact with the cortical bone directly, of course the load transmission will go directly to the cortical bone and there is no incentive to form a second cortical around the implant. So, um, therefore, the surface of the implant is of minor importance. So, in this moment, I would like to take a short break. Thanks for listening to the first part of the lecture on bone. Thank you very much.